very warm welcome both to those of you who are here and also to those of you who are watching online. The pattern for this evening will be the one that we always use. We will ask our speaker to speak for, say, three quarters of an hour or so, and then we will open to um, questions, comment, discussion. Um, if you want to ask a question, um, could you wait, please, until the microphone is brought to you so that everyone can hear and also the people online can hear? I'm Doreen Rosman, and I'm one of the committee that puts these lectures together. It gives me huge personal pleasure to be welcoming Barbara Glasson as our speaker today. Barbara is a Kentish lass. She went to the Simon Langton Girls. She attended this church. And more years ago than either of us care to remember, we taught the Young People's Department together. I don't think any of us, least of all Barbara, would have predicted then how your life would turn out. Um, when her three children reached school age, she entered the Methodist ministry. And while serving in Liverpool, she set up what became known as the Bread Church, a way of being a faith community in a city centre, which still exists under the name somewhere else, um, and they're still making bread and giving it away. When serving in Bradford, she worked in interreligious dialogue and has been awarded the Archbishop's Peace and Reconciliation Award for Interfaith Dialogue. And then to crown it all, in 2019-20, she was elected to be president of the Methodist Conference. She's currently working as a tutor at Queen's Ecumenical College in Birmingham. She has also written, and her latest book was published on May the 1st, um, entitled Peace is a Doing Word, which is the subject of her talk this evening. Barbara, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, it's very strange and very wonderful to be back in St. Peter's. It kind of has um, memories and half memories um, in the walls. And uh, one of the memories I have is uh, preparing for Sunday school with Doreen and how very exacting she was. <laughs> and how very well we taught the young people. <laughs> It's just a delight to be here and to see familiar faces and those that I have yet to know. So thank you for your invitation. When I agreed to do this talk, I was collecting together prayers and poems and stories on the theme of peace. And I was playing with the idea that peace might be a doing word, a verb. I was at that point president of conference and I had been locked down like everybody else. And locked down for me uh, meant that I didn't go to Scotland, I didn't go to the Channel Islands, um, I, I didn't go to Shetland, I didn't go to the Isle of Man. I went to my attic in Derbyshire to work out what it meant to be president in lockdown, and that's why, really, I was writing. Little did I know when I was busy writing that by the time I gave this talk tonight uh, there would be war in Ukraine and the book now seems much more relevant and pertinent than it was when I was writing on a whim if you like. So I bring it to you and I bring thoughts from it to you 
not as anything that's complete and neat with a bow on top, this is what is peace, this is what we should do about it, but rather a way to open a conversation with you theologians so that we might together explore what it means to be people of peace, people who are doing and being peace, and how we might be faithful to our Christian calling to be peacemakers together. I have a PowerPoint which will not give you a lot of things. A lot of, I do believe in death by PowerPoint, so I'm not going to inflict that on you. But what I have done is put some of the poems and prayers from the book onto the PowerPoint so that if your mind should wander and you begin to think in lateral ways, you might be able to focus on those. And I'm going to intersperse my input uh, with some of those poems too. And I'm hoping that I'll be able to coordinate this in some miraculous way. So let us first of all take a moment of quiet. Show us this most excellent way. Sparks of glory in the ordinary, glimmers of hope in the melancholy, glints of prayer in the drudgery, surprise of change in the mystery. Show us this most excellent way. Amen. Here we go. Oh, downwards. Downwards. Uh huh. Pray. <laughs> Hold it down. Right. Ah, there we are. Now, if I press the downwards one, will it do it again? Good. Hold it down? No. <laughs> what am I doing? Okay. Okay. I want us to start our thinking using the words from Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. I think that peace is one of those words, rather like mission or community, that we think is a jolly good thing, but we have no idea what it is. It's something that we aspire to, it's something that we hope for, it's a destination maybe, but to be able to say this is peace, this is what we mean by peace, then we can go all over the place. There are plenty of self-help books that enable us to pursue our inner peacefulness. Practices of mindfulness, yoga, meditation, reflections that promise us a stress-free existence and the appropriate use of time and energy. In them, we are encouraged to center ourselves, to empty our minds, to focus on the inner core. And somehow or other, an inner zenness will bring us to a deep well-being and peacefulness. But even if we were to spend every day in the lotus position, and I can't imagine ever doing that, or in deepest contemplation in the swimming pool, I could consider doing that, this would not change the world around us significantly. Me being tranquil and centered is not going to sort out Ukraine or Somalia or Myanmar. On the contrary, it has the risk that we would neglect those things in the pursuit of our own peacefulness. 
Most of us consider that we have lived the last 50 years or so in peacetime. But is that the same thing as being at peace? Or have we simply exported our conflict offshore? We have certainly exported arms to the seemingly unscrupulous benefit of the British economy. Surely peace is more than simply not having conflict at home. Have we inhabited a false peace where we have deluded ourselves that our domestic prosperity is not at the expense of others? And then, if there were no war anywhere on the globe, no conflict, no arms in our imagination, no weapons of mass destruction, would we then be at peace? I suspect not. Because peace is much more than the absence of war, because it is predicated on justice, on equality, on environmental sustainability, and, dare I say so, on love. Not just love for ourselves, but love for our neighbours, and most importantly, love for our enemies. Yes, peace is one of those words. And if all of that wasn't complicated enough, the verse from Colossians refers to the peace of Christ. That would be the Christ who said, think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against the father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law. That Jesus. Yeah, that really helps. In this talk, I'm going to circle around the word peace using the verse from Colossians. And as I've said, it's not my intention to answer the questions because I don't have the answers, but rather to explore them a little and set some of the rascals running. I want to hook these reflections on that Colossians verse, but even in doing so, know there is much more to be said. But we have a short time, so onward we go. Between you and me, let there be peace. Between here and there, let there be peace. Between right and wrong, let there be peace. Between certainty and doubt, let there be peace. The deep peace of enough, the deep peace of together, the deep peace of sufficient, the deep peace of friendship, be ours, yours and mine, here and forever. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. Let's leave aside for a moment what we actually mean by the peace of Christ. But let's look at the imperative that peace should rule in our hearts. In the letter to the Colossians, this is a message to the early Christian community. And it seems to be an instruction concerning the way to be followers of Jesus. We would expect these first disciples to greet each other with shalom or salam, peace be with you. But the injunction to let peace rule in our hearts implies the desire for peace that is not just on the surface of things, but is deeply embedded within our very selves, embedded in the essence of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Peace needs to rule in our hearts, be engraved on our, on our being, be the very essence of who we are. Peace is not simply an add-on, the icing on the cake, the postscript when we've done everything else. On the contrary, peace is the rule by which we should live, the essence of being the follower of Jesus. And quite a bit of the letter to the Colossians is devoted to how we should live, how we should live a godly way of life, how to avoid false teaching and how to be authentic within the faith. Whoever wrote the letter is exhorting those who might be confused by all these pressures and strains to put peace at the very heart of their being. Peacefulness is a hallmark of Jesus. Let's think about the word rule. In English, it can mean to have dominion, to conquer, to be in charge. Let peace be in charge of your heart. But it can also mean a rule to measure, 
so peace could be the thing by which we measure our capacity for our hearts to love. The rule of the kingdom is not a rule book, but rather a measuring stick, a meter rule, if you like, a, a, a ruler that, that gives space and span. Let everything we do be measured by the life of Christ. Let peace be the measure of us. Help me not to measure life by any standard other than the rule of peace and love. Give me the capacity to go the extra mile, turn the other cheek, draw circles of peace in the shifting sands of conflict. Help me not to measure others with a rigid rule, an unbendable rule, an unbreakable rule, but only by the span of your open, accepting, loving arms. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. The reason that we should live by the rule of peace is because we are one body. We are the body of Christ, the church, the followers, the ones that are called into his presence. So to have peace written on our hearts is not simply so that we, we individually can be on the right side of God but rather it's so that we can live within a peaceful community. Peace is not simply a personal thing. It's about us together. It's about how we live together, how we belong together as the body of Christ. So we can see that the peace of Christ and the peace of community overlap. And we're not talking simply about what Jesus said about peace, but rather the life of the church as being the body of Christ in the world. To be the body of Christ, we are called to be peacemakers. The two go side by side. We're called to be peace builders. We're called to be at peace with each other in community, to be peaceful together. And this is vocational. We're called into it. We are called to peace. And we are called to peace as individuals, but most importantly, we're called to peace because we are followers of Jesus. That is what he requires of us. For the last 10 years, I've worked in city centre Bradford. Now, if you want to do culture shock, go to city centre Bradford. Yorkshire people are very strange. Speaks a southerner. I lived in a community, right in the heart of a community, which was mainly Pakistani heritage Muslim. My neighbours were Pakistani heritage, the shopkeeper was Pakistani heritage, the people all around me were speaking Urdu. We worked together, Methodist presence in the city centre at a place called Touchstone, still there, still working to bring communities together, to listen, to learn, uh, to share culture and faith, and to do so in order to bring about community cohesion, or at least that's what you have to say when you fill out the grant application form. I dislike the phrase community cohesion. It sounds like we're being stuck together by some sort of uh, glue. But really, community cohesion is about friendship, about learning, about listening, about looking into each other's eyes, about being able to disagree well, about sitting around the same table, about sharing food, about getting to see each other's humanity and rejoicing in it, as well as being challenged by it. It's a reciprocal learning process. What you can't put on the grant application form 
is that you're building peace, making peace, being peacemakers. Because a grant application form requires a quantitative outcome. I hear from the groans that you've experienced this sort of grant application form. And how can you put a quantitative outcome on the fact that people haven't killed each other, haven't rioted, haven't uh, been offensive in the street, haven't been racist? How do you do that? But what we were doing was being peacemakers, making peace. We are creation's possible people, ligaments holding together, flexed and perplexed, speaking our puzzlements, flawed, lavish, broken, flailing around in thickets of uncertainty, yet wrapped in grace, clutching at the hem of love. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. Now I think this is where that quotation pivots. Supposing that instead of seeing the word peace as a noun, we read the verse as if peace were a verb, we are called to peace, to peace. In other words, we don't see peace simply as an aspiration or a destination or an absence of conflict, but what, rather we see peace as an action, as a verb. Now I'm sure that in such an erudite company as this, there are linguists here that will tell me that this is not the meaning of the original text, but I'm quite unrepentant because the Bible speaks differently uh, doesn't it all the time? I want to suppose that peace can be a verb and I want us to wonder what that difference might mean. What difference does it make that we are called to peace? During my time as president of the Methodist Conference I travelled uh, first to Myanmar and then to Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh. In Myanmar, I visited many wonderful people, Christian communities and villages. I saw the grave of um, many soldiers who had served out there, and I realized the history of that wonderful and beautiful country that was presented to me, and we are aware now that they are back under military rule. But one particular thing I did was I visited the Rohingya both in Myanmar and at Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh. The refugees who had in the middle of the night experienced their villages being torched, their men disappeared and fled for their lives. I heard stories from women who had picked up their children and carried them above their heads, wading up the river. Some died from river stake bites, others just waded through the darkness to try to get to safety. In Bangladesh, they were reluctantly taken in by the Bangladeshi government and housed, you could say housed, at Cox's Bazaar. Only seeing the conditions of that refugee camp brought home to me um, what this humanitarian plight looks like. It wasn't so much that it's an awful refugee camp, there are many worse I know, but rather there are a million people in it with no hope of return. But more than that, um, it is now eroded on the edge of the country. 
so that there is a danger of environmental catastrophe. All right. All right. You're all right. Okay. 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 You're welcome to be with us. So just let's go back to that situation where the refugees are on the edge of an environmental catastrophe, where the beach is eroded, where the cyclones are coming, and any minute, and it will happen, those refugee camps will be washed away. And I think you saw on the day that uh, we English were very uh, relieved to be released from a lockdown so that we could go and have our hair cut and we could go um, out and about. There was a huge fire in the Rohingya camps uh, where, I mean, uh, devastation happened again. Those displaced people were displaced again. In the middle of that, there is a small um, project which is funded by All We Can, and the Methodists here will know about All We Can, our uh, development agency, called Shantikana. It means a place of peace and sanctuary where women particularly can get out of the overcrowded situation in which they live and take time uh, to uh, sleep, uh, to chat, uh, to have space for themselves. A Christian woman, every day, takes the bus to Shantikana in order to enable that piece of work to happen. Most of the Rohingya are Muslims, as you will appreciate. And to be a Christian is not easy anyway in Bangladesh. But each day, quietly and sacrificially, she goes there to make a peaceful community. Heart, our hearts sacrificially offered to Jesus, doing peace as a verb every day. Maybe on her own, maybe on our own, maybe together, but each day vocationally doing peace. It's gone away. Never mind. Bless me, I pray, with an unsettled spirit, that I will be restless until I see justice. Bless me, I pray, with a troubled mind, that a heartache for fairness will disturb my decisions. Bless me, I pray, with a determined body, that I will stand firm with those who have need. So, what of justice? Surely Christians are called to live for justice. We've all seen placards that say no justice, no peace, as if justice is a precursor to peace. And if we were to relate this to the plight of the Rohingya refugees, then clearly there cannot be peace until they are given back the homeland, their villages, and know what has happened to the disappeared, the hundreds that are disappeared. And nearer to home, could there ever be peace in Ukraine after this time of war, unless there was some kind of restorative justice? Clearly, peace is more than simply the absence of war, but does it need justice before it can be achieved? It seems to me that justice and peace are uncomfortable bedfellows, and within both words lie the question, whose justice and whose peace? When Jesus said he was, going, he was not going to bring peace but a sword, was he calling for the kind of resistance to the injustice of Roman occupation that would inevitably lead to a loss of peace? Did he mean that in order to get to the right place, to bring in the kingdom, it would be necessary to rebel and resist in such a way that peace would be lost in the process? Is that what he meant? 
Surely peace without justice is a false peace, but the quest for justice does not always lead to peace. Is it sufficient for the Rohingya refugees to have a place of peace in a refugee camp following a genocide, knowing they will never return and are at risk of environmental catastrophe? So often justice and peace pull against each other, they swirl around each other, they contradict each other, they are both demand attention to and from each other. Justice and peace, the dance between them. What an extraordinary thing to be alive. What a mystery to step into me each morning as this blue planet, my home, turns once again towards her distant star for light and warmth. What an extraordinary gift is given to me. Even thought, even though this day seems complicated, relationships tangled, Responsibilities too weighty. When I open my eyes in the morning, let my first thought be, thank you. Because we are one body, because peace rules in our hearts, because of the dance between justice and peace, because peace might be a doing word, then we are called, even so, to live thanksgiving. I, was, I once had an argument with somebody in Islamabad airport. It's a good opening line for a story. I'd been in Pakistan for three weeks and I wanted to go home. I was a white woman traveling on my own and I wanted to be with my family. Islamabad airport is a confusing place if you want to be going home. A man who had spotted me in the departure lounge decided that it was time for me to become a Muslim. Clearly, I was out of place and had my head uncovered and that he needed to tell me how it was possible for me to become a Muslim. And to be perfectly honest and blunt with you, I really didn't want to become a Muslim right at that moment. He talked to me for maybe about 40 minutes and I have to confess, I wasn't really listening. But after that time, I said to him, I tell you what, if you just give me three reasons why I should become a Muslim, I'll give you three reasons why I think you should become a Christian, and then maybe we can get on the plane. Well, he did give me three reasons. It took another 20 minutes. And I can't honestly tell you what reasons he gave, because I was busy trying to think three reasons why he should become a Christian. <laughs> And I can't remember the first two, except it was something to do with scripture being alive. And I think I probably did say something about the Trinity, but I'm not sure it was very coherent. But I then said, because Christianity is the only world religion where we're called to love our enemies and pray for those that persecute us. And then we got on the plane. After I'd had a good night's sleep, and woke up the following morning or a couple of mornings later, I began to think, is that right? Is Christianity the only world religion where we're called to love our enemies and pray for those that persecute us? And I had to phone a friend. But whether it be unique or whether it be embedded in other faiths, that's the thing, isn't it? We are called to love our enemies and pray for those that persecute us. Anybody can love their neighbours. Well, it's tricky sometimes, but we can give it a good go. And most of the time we can love our friends, but loving our enemies and praying for those who persecute us, that's the only thing that's going to make a difference. That's the only thing that's ever going to make a difference. Peace is a vocation. Peace is a doing word. Peace is a rule. Peace is about the way of Jesus. Peace is about loving our enemies and praying for those that persecute us. That is what we are called to be. That is who we are.
and so a word of blessing. Bless all who pace the floor tonight, hold babes in arms or restless thoughts. Bless those who stare at stars this night, hold distant loves or shattered dreams. Bless all who curse the dark this night, hold angry thoughts or broken hearts. Bless us with peace and more this night, with constant grace, with love's insight. Amen. There are all sorts of phrases that you've just used that are echoing through my mind and not least this last one and as you read it I was thinking of Ukraine and wondering what those words meant in that situation but we've got plenty of time to explore such things so Judith is going to come and take the mic have you got a microphone Judith Judith has got a microphone which she'll bring round to um, anyone who would like to ask a question, make a comment, raise a subject for discussion. Um, but please wait for the mic. Who'd like to go first? Try the other mic, maybe. I just like oh. <laughs> <laughs> I just like to ask how your idea of peace as a measured rule um, is there something along that spectrum that does allow for resistance, which might mean um, armed resistance in the case of nations at war. And I'm, I'm sort of thinking also of Bonhoeffer and his, you know, his decision to get involved in the, the plot against Hitler. I mean, where does your analysis fit in with that? <laughs> well, I think everybody in the room would have a different answer to that, possibly. Um, I think there's a difference between resistance and armed resistance. Uh, personally, I'm speaking personally, there are clearly things that we need to resist and the way in which we do that will be between us and our conscience um, uh, as Bonhoeffer illustrated so well um, and I would like to say that arms resistance is beyond that personally I would say that uh, others would answer that question differently I think there's something about a rule which gives which pushes things to a different space. If you think that of measuring, um, I mean, I, I think about when I was in Liverpool City Centre, there were two, two uh, people that wanted just to hit each other. There were two big chaps who were fairly drunk and wanted just to hit each other. And, and being able to sort of be in the space between them. I don't advise this as a way forward, but the sense of that the space, opening up the space measured things differently. And um, there is something about, uh, that there's a resonance between the, therefore, between inner peace and how you keep peace. So that, so that when our first instinct isn't, isn't violence, but our first instinct is to, measure, to be measured and to give space. I don't know whether that answers your question. I'm, you know, I, as I said, I'm, I'm circling it. Anybody else have a comment in relation to that? Oh, all right. About what the lady's been speaking about. Have a question? There's a question here? Yeah. 
Quaker will answer the question. There are so many things you've told us that one could follow up, you know, starting with the idea that peace begins in one's own heart, in one's own family, in one's own community, in one's own place of work. But you then went on to talk about how peace concerns hospitality to refugees, and you talked deeply about what happens in Myanmar. And you think that in Europe, we succeeded in the middle of the 20th century in absorbing 50 million refugees. But are we ready to absorb the next 15 million who will be flooded out of their homes by mm. climate change? Mm. And the question I have for you is, how do we give the current generation an opportunity to understand what peace means. That in my generation, a lot of us had an enormous amount of learning through national service, learning partly about war, but also very much about peace. And I am reminded of President Kennedy, who said he thought he would like to enable Americans to discover what the outside world was like. And he called his movement the Peace Corps. And it did train a whole generation of Americans out of their insularity. Mm -hmm. And so I find myself constantly wondering, what can we do in this country with the generation, many of whom are unemployed, many of whom don't know what the future is like, to adopt some kind of a program which will enable them to see what is the meaning of peace. I wish I had the answer to that question. I mean, I think we, we can see the loss of community, can't we? And the loss of, uh, so the, the sense of the individual being paramount or being alone, two sides of the same coin. Um, and, and I think the sense of what good community looks like is always the beginning of, of, build, of, of peacemaking and peace building. That's, that's when you begin to learn how to negotiate, how to understand, to listen, and all those sorts of things. I mean, Paul, you, you might have some reflection about peace in schools and how, how to communicate that. Sorry, I've landed you in that there. <laughs> You've got a moment when the microphone Maybe comes. <laughs> I, I was just reflecting that I, I'm chaplain at Kent College and we've got uh, six Ukrainian and nine Russian borders at the moment. And uh, on the first day of um, Russia going into Ukraine, uh, the head teacher and I met all of the Ukrainian students one by one in, in his, the study and, and asked them, you know, how things were for them and where their families were and was everything going to be all right. Um, and I felt incredibly helpless, actually, because there wasn't that much that we could do. And, and I thought, you know, I, and this whole thing about peace being a doing word. And in my helplessness, I just said to them, look, I, I'm going to be in the school chapel at quarter to two. I'll have some candles and I'll be there. And if you want to come down, you can do that. And um, I set all the candles out. And uh, on the dot of quarter to two, uh, the door of the chapel opened, and not only all of the Ukrainian, but almost all of our Russian students came in together as a group, sat around the communion table, um, sat and lit candles and cried and mm -hmm. held hands and prayed together and then left. And I just, I, I reflect that what they did at that moment was actually not so much about the prayer as it was about the physical kind of holding of each other in that space and saying, for the Russians particularly, saying, not in our name is this being done. And that, that's lived with me for the last two months as, as a kind of a picture of what peace can be. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know that it asks, answers the question, but I think it does point to the fact that young people 
I think do understand and do want to know and, and do want to feel peace. And actually, I've, I think the young people I speak to feel very nervous mm. about the future mm. and want there to be peace and, and are very mistrustful of groups of people who have gone before them, two or three, you know, perhaps a generation in advance, who are in charge of the world, who seem to them to be doing an incredibly bad job of um, making a world that they want to live in. Mm. And, and how they work to find peace in that is, is a crucial set of learnings and understandings that have to happen. Yes, and what leaders are embodying currently is, is not a great role model, with some notable exceptions, uh, about integrity and um, justice and, and fair community. So leadership, I mean, what, what I was going to say about uh, really training people into leadership so that they're able to be better leaders. Yeah. Thank you, well, thank you very much for the talk. Um, Canterbury has a twinning association with Vladimir in Russia. And we have friends over the, over the years um, relationships and visits and of course this Ukrainian war has created uh, turbulence uh, there's a number of friends in Vladimir who are so uh, absorbed by the media in Russia uh, that any discussion about the Ukrainian situation Create, would create, would, uh, create big arguments. So the subject has largely been ignored. So there's a sort of cold peace. Um, and it just uh, emphasizes the need for common ground, for there to be true peace, understanding of common issues yes. and truth. Yes, and, and an awareness that we we don't have all the truth either, isn't it? You know, we, we know what we're told, just as Russians know what they're told. Oh, absolutely, yes. I'm sure there's exaggerations on our side as well. Well, what are you Western saying? <laughs> um, there was a question at the back here, for, and then this gentleman here. And I, I don't know, are we able to take questions from people online or is there no, no, no? <laughs> I'm thinking about my own church. It's an open evangelical church, quite large. And we've just begun to think seriously about inclusion. I'm not sure whether it's got a small eye or a big eye. <laughs> Probably both. Um, for 25 years, we had the ministry of an absolutely splendid priest. We just never mentioned it. It just was. We have an inclusive, small i congregation, all sorts of denominations, all sorts of sexuality, all sorts of ages, etc., etc. But we've just begun to think about inclusion and, in a way, wished we hadn't. Because it looks as though inclusion will cause conflict. Mm -hmm. Do we use the right code words in an inclusion statement on our front door, which will make it clear <laughs> to one set of people that we are inclusive and to another set of people that we're not? Mm. <laughs> one of the congregations stood up the other day and said, this is a wonderful church. We just love all these children running about. If you don't like children running about, find another church. Yeah. <laughs> Luckily, we know him. He's fine. It's okay. But you just see how quickly mm. you can slip into something mm. which you didn't intend. And we shall be hard-pressed, I think, to keep peace at the center of it. And I just wonder, you know these conversations that are going on. I'm a member of General Synod. I'm just dying to get to York in July for the continued skirmishes 
and, and those are not peaceful skirmishes. No. They, they, are, they are polite, but they are not peaceful. Um, so, could you just reflect a little just bit on Just sort that those? out for you. <laughs> no, 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 don't. You, ple you can't. No. No. But could you just reflect on how we might think about peace in those circumstances? Yes. It's interesting, the inclusion, the inclusion agenda, isn't it? That in order to include some, we exclude others almost inadvertently. Um, and 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 it's a it's a tricky, really tricky one. And and some people will exclude themselves, you know, won't they? Um, and and then I, I really don't like the word inclusion because it always implies it's my place and I'll include you in if you're like me, uh, rather than we're diverse pe we're diverse people of group of equals. Um, we. Uh, Methodist Church struggling with what it means to live with contradictory convictions. Um, and, and this is where peace and justice come up against each other. Um, is it right that we live with contradictory convictions, or is one point of view actually the right point of view, and the other one the wrong point of view, and therefore we shouldn't live with the contradiction, we should just plump for one or the other? And, you know, it, we, go, <laughs> we go backwards and forwards. But I suppose the bottom line is that our fellowship together matters more than whether we agree or not. That somehow or other we have to remain friends even in our disagreement. Because conflict is inevitable. We were, you know, two people in a room, you know, there will always be disagreement. You'd have to hope that's the case, otherwise we're, we're just clones, aren't we? So, so conflict and disagreement is part of the human condition. It's a question of how we continue the fellowship within that and hold each other in love. And, and I wouldn't say there was any kind of easy answer to that because that's the sacrificial way of Jesus, mm. isn't it? Mm. Um, and, and we will get it wrong and have to apologize and come back around and you know, upset somebody or somebody will take the, mm. um, you know, throw their dummy out the pram or stomp off or, you, you know, <laughs> we have to live with that reality of being human. Uh, and yet still love each other, and that's, that's a calling of... Years ago, I had a conversation over coffee with a fellow congregant, and we discussed the first two chapters of Genesis. Mm. And he believed that it was historical fact, mm. and I believed it was a myth in the best sense, and mm. we uh, talked about it and argued about it. Mm. And at the end, we actually said, we're not going to change each other's minds, mm. but we'll have a coffee together, and we're going living together. And one day, one of us will work out We'll find out who's right. <laughs> Neither of you, probably. <laughs> he has, yes. I'm still waiting. But the, the business of, of, of personal relationships, yes. of sitting together and saying right at the beginning, I'm not going to try and change your mind. Yes, and being open to conversion. Yes. Uh, which I wasn't in Islamabad airport. No, no. So I was not friends with the Muslim man that was trying to convert me because I, wasn't, I was resistant to that and he wasn't going to yeah. be converted to be Christian either. Yeah. We weren't open to each other, whereas I think in the work that I'd done in Bradford, neither of us are trying to convert each other to our own point of view, no. but we're being open to each other in ways that's opening up a, th a third sort of dimension. The space, be the space between people has a life, doesn't it? Mm. There's, there's you and me, and then there's the space. Yeah. There's the space and the interaction between us, which has a life. And sometimes we'll surprise both of us. Yes. Paul's very moving account of what happened at Kent College took my mind. Uh, zooming back to the uh, second annual general meeting of Canterbury's interface group, we'd arranged this um, on a date that may resonate with us. Uh, other people obviously had made plans for that day as well. It's the date we now know as 9-11. And, and uh, very similar emotions to Paul's. You know, what on earth can we do in the face of, of what's just happened? This cataclysmic event of the World Trade Center being uh, attacked in that way. 
So we decided, very similar to Paul, with a similar reaction, that we would light a candle and we would keep silence and we just pray that the retaliation from the Americans would not be devastating. And then we just got on with the business of the interface group, which was making peace, in Hans Kung's words, um, which um, your previous speaker in this series was the second chair of, of the interface group, and she quoted Hans Kung, no peace in the world until there's peace between the religions, and no peace between the religions until there's dialogue between the religions. Mm -hmm. Wise word. Yes, thank you, Paul, for that. And I think the sense, I mean, in interreligious dialogue, that we, ha we are people of faith, even if we have a different faith. And that, I mean, I spent more time in Bradford talking about faith than I've ever done in a Methodist church on a Sunday morning, you know? In the Methodist church on a Sunday morning, you talk about the roof or, you know, the coffee or the flowers or something. You know, in interreligious dialogue, you talk about faith. And it's such that's such a gift because we can see, you see the um, you see your communality rather than your difference, and you see each other's humanity, especially especially if you eat together or are create, do creative things together. Um, yes. So, and, and I think the silence. You know, we run out of we run out of words. We don't we don't always need the words to explain or to to analyze, do we? We not sometimes need to sit within the silence of the pain and mystery of it all, but do that together as a community. Oh, you. <laughs> You're allowed to ask a question. <laughs> um, your suggestion, um, and the one that was made, um, that to sit down with someone with whom one disagrees and to talk without the intention um, and without the expectation of converting each other. The thing that runs through my mind is it takes two to tango. And what if the other person is quite determined to convert me as your man in Islamabad? Um, and it's very natural to, to try to respond in kind. How should we respond? <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you how we shouldn't respond because um, we had a, what we wanted to be an inclusive community in Liverpool. We were making bread together. Anybody that came was welcome. You know, whoever you are, whether you were street homeless, whether you were coming out of an office, whether you were a child, whether you had learning disabilities, everybody was welcome. And we made bread and we all got, you know, stuck in the dough and all this sort of stuff and uh, making community all the time. And then this wandering, um, uh, how do I say this politely? Um, a wandering Christian um, evangelist um, came outside our window, out, we were on the second floor above a bookshop, and started shouting about um, the end times and, uh, you know, revelation and, uh, you, sp you know, your sins and, you know, you're about to be damned and doomed. And um, I said, I thought, well, how can I handle this? So I went down the stairs and said, very quietly and gently, I said, um, now, would you mind just moving somewhere else? Because we are actually already Christians here and you don't need to shout at us. He said, all the more reason to shout, I'll shout even louder. <laughs> <laughs> By the end of the morning, I was off, I getting boiling oil and pouring it out the window. It was in a true pacifist way. Uh, so what was the question? Yes, when somebody is very set in that, um, so sometimes I, I think we have to walk away because if there is no, if there is no communal, if there is no communal, communality, then, then the only thing we can do is to, is to walk, walk away peacefully, as peacefully as we can. But I mean, it, this is a human predicament, isn't it? Because our adrenaline rises and, you know, we know we're right. And but for the, for, you know, belief, by very definition, we believe things that we think are right. 
because nobody believes things they think are wrong because that's not you, you wouldn't believe them if you thought they were wrong um, so I don't have the answer to it but I think noticing it and knowing uh, knowing when there is no communality and being able to distance from it I mean Quakers will have much more wisdom on this than me but um, the, Otherwise, we just get face to face, head on, don't we? There is no measure. There is that. We're not. We're not being measured. We're not able to be measured. And sometimes we need to disagree, you know, and and um, and being able to disagree peacefully is that's a challenge too. Glenn, so yeah. This isn't a question or anything, it's just amazement. How do people negotiate to get people out of Mariupol? No one's going to help Glenn out. No, there is no answer. There's no answer. I wonder whether we have any more questions, any more questions or thoughts. Well, no, it's just I'm still um, perplexed. I think it comes from watching too much news stream off the computer, but but there does seem to be a tendency now for people to do instant reaction. Yes. Hence all these awful stabbings yes. and, and people shooting, you know, and and just flying off the handle. Um, and I I just don't know how we what's gone wrong because it it might be a sign of age, but it seems to me that. You know, it didn't used to be like this. Um, and now it just seems to be no idea of deferred reaction. I just wondered if you had any reflections on the culture and what might be a way of turning it around. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Well, of course, the in internet makes us very instant, doesn't it? Everything's instant. Twitter and everything is stream of consciousness stuff often um, and and it's the age we live in and we don't understand it totally and we've all fallen into it because of being locked down for you know we've all been on zoom and um, communicating by emails and I mean I've been teaching pastoral theology on screen <laughs> you know, how do you teach pastoral theology without a human being in the room um, so that sense of um, we, 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 we are being formed and we are learning from this experience, aren't we, of, of living on screen and living very fast. Um, I, I, I think we mustn't believe that that's all people are doing. <laughs> um, because people do, all people also do live in the real world. And, um, and we mustn't put younger people into the stereotype box of they're just online all the time, and we're not. I mean, I've travelled a lot on trains, and I have to say that it's my generation that are more on this than kids quite often. Um, and interestingly, at the Methodist Conference last year, or would it be last year? younger people were saying get us off screen you know we, we want to do less on screen because they don't, had all their schooling on screen um, and they really just wanted to be out with their mates <laughs> um, and see real people and date them you know and have fun um, so I think we mustn't just c 
catastrophize the world because of that tendency of what you know of interpreting it in one particular way. Having said that, um, I wonder whether there's a generational thing about embodying different ways of being, um, uh, different generations. You know, I think the grandparent grandchild relationship is really significant for one. Um, we had a lovely time with our youngest, our middle grandson, who just wanted to run barefoot down the Derbyshire Dales. And, uh, and uh, I said, okay, I didn't think it would last, actually, because there's prickles and nettles and all sorts of stuff. But it, it was great. He just, that was just joy. He had to be hosed off at the end of it. Uh, but that was joy, you know. <laughs> so I, I suppose there is. Um, and I suppose there is a, a, a call upon the church to embody a different way. You know, we we can also be caught up with the Zoom and the, everything's online and and uh, you know email quick emails after the church council. You know, at midnight because you're grumpy and stuff like this. Um, but but how do we embody doing things more steadily? How do we live a slower life? <laughs> Because stress is catching, isn't it? So I think we, you know, not not to notice it, but not to not to um, not to think that that's all there is. Because we don't live in a flat screen world, do we? Really. We are. Is there somebody at the back? No. Oh, sorry. Um, as Judith will know, I had the privilege 50 years ago of serving in South Africa, where at the time when the World Council of Churches, this links up with a question about violence, gave grants to the armed wing of the Ash African National Congress in exile in Zambia. Uh, this was, shall we say, extremely unpopular with the South African government and of course made the mainstream churches in South Africa more unpopular because we were part of the World Council of Churches. But later on in that place I was able, along with a lovely African Methodist minister, to get together a group, three different races, speaking three different languages, where we prayed and studied the Bible using our own languages and coming together and, in a way, creating a bit of new South Africa uh, some 40 years before they actually voted mm. for it. Mm. So coming together does make all the yeah. difference yeah. for the future. Yeah, absolutely. And how we do that with Russia and Ukraine, other than to pray the great Russian prayer. I think when you're in the midst of a conflict like you can see in Russia and the Ukraine, it's not very possible. It may, it, there may be those stories happening that we haven't heard yet, there may be, but it is probably currently not possible except um, away from the conflict. But at the edges of, the con of conflict or post-conflict, then, then that work has to begin, doesn't it? <laughs> One of the phrases you threw up on screen, which sort of jumped out and hit me, and I've been sort of staring at ever since, is between certainty and doubt, let there be peace. Would you like to unpack that a bit? <laughs> oh, heck. Well, I suppose it comes on a personal level, it's about, I want to know, I want to be sure, I want to have facts, I want to, uh, I want to be certain. Um, and at the same time, um, nothing is certain, 
and, and we always live with that provisional nature of things. What we thought was right and true 10 years, 20 years ago, we now see differently. And, um, and, and um, okay, to give an example, my brother and I lived in the same family, um, you know, all our childhood um, had pretty much, well, had the same parents, um, had the same meals, um, went to different schools, but played in the same garden. And now we will tell completely different sides of stories that we both recollect. Um, clearly, I was badly treated and was, you know, as a younger sister, was always, you know, <laughs> and he said that I just got away with too much because I was younger sister. Um, I am sure my story is right because I remember it clearly. <laughs> and he's completely sure that his version of it is right. So we, I am both, we live between the certainty of our own interpretation of the world and the certainty of others that cast doubt on our interpretation of that. I mean, that would be a foolish example, but that's what I'm trying to say. So we're always living in this dynamic. So we can be certain that the first chapter of Genesis is fact. We can be certain that it's myth, in the best sense. <laughs> um, and both of us must live between the certainty and the doubt. And I think that was reflected in what you said about, you know, one day we'll find out who was true, who was right. Uh, and I, I think there's evidence that we tend to believe the thing that we're told by the first reliable source that's told it to us. So if I've read it in The Guardian, I know it's true. And if somebody says that, oh, no, you know, that wasn't quite what happened, I will revise my understanding of The Guardian truth, but I probably won't change it, because that's the one that I heard first, yeah? If you've heard it first in The Sun or something, you would have a different interpretation of that. So we should always, I should always live between the certainty of the Guardian being right and the doubt that they are always right, yeah? <laughs> we, live between, we live in that dynamic of certainty and doubt, and it's a healthy thing. I think it's a healthy thing um, that we need to be um, earthed and real in, within that dynamic. Is that making any sense? <laughs> I think that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> is it is it live? It yes, is. perhaps I better stand up and make myself visible. Barbara I've been puzzling how to thank you for this. <clears throat> I kept thinking all the way through, she's weaving such a wonderful tapestry. And then my mind went quite quickly to a scarf, a long woolly scarf I have at home, which is a rainbow scarf. It is nothing to do with sexuality. I bought it in the year 1989 in Basel, Switzerland. I was, had the great privilege of being there with a small diocesan group from the Diocese of Canterbury at the great conference, Justice, Peace and Integrity of Creation, mm -hmm. which I think was organized not by the WCC, but by KEC, the Conference of European Churches. Some people here will know John Arnold. He was actually chairing it. That was the most amazing experience at Pentecost 1989. Little did we know what was going to happen later that year, but there was something in the air. I remember seeing um, people from the Baltic nations in their national costumes. There was something growing. The spirit was at work. But the thing that really came through to me and does every time I put on that scarf is that it was about justice, peace, and the integrity of creation. And you were weaving all of those together. There was that one poem about our blue planet. Now, we came together then, people from all over Europe, perhaps further afield, I'm not sure, but a great many different languages. 
things are not like that at the moment, but pray God we can come together again. And thank you for keeping us on that track and weaving that tapestry, that rainbow for all of us. Thank you very much, Barbara. Um, any of you who may be interested in looking at more of what, of what Barbara has been writing have the opportunity to. Her book was published on May the 1st and we actually have some copies um, in the vestibule. And more than that, um, the published price I think is something like 16 99 but because we have them here at author rate, you can get them tonight for £12. Um, so they're in the vestibule if anybody would like um, to buy a copy and all proceeds from the book go to the Fellowship of Reconciliation and the Methodist Peace Fellowship. And then to remind you that our next meeting is on Wednesday the 15th of June when Jonathan Arnold who's the Director of Communities and Partnerships in the Diocese, and also a former member of the 16, will be talking to us on the subject, Sacred Music in a Secular Age, a Theological Perspective. And um, I've lost Judith, where, yeah. Am I right in thinking that there will be some music played? Um, we hope so. Um, so Jonathan Arnold, on the 15th of June, and we look forward to seeing as many of you as possible here, and hopefully some of the people who are online as well. Go well. <laughs>